Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to uh, the Baron Flying Club in VR in RAF Manston. We're in Manston today. We've been flying the P-51 today. And uh, I've got a nice picture of it on my green screen behind me for you to see because it's US Air Force Week uh, this week at Manston. And uh, I'll be flying the P-47 Thunderbolt tomorrow. And I've got loads, I've got shit loads of airplanes in the hangar and I, I, I never fly them and I'm thinking to myself, well, I should, should make an effort to sort of focus on a certain type of uh, aircraft. So I'm doing the, I'm doing the, um, the American ones this week. I've done the P51D today, although I couldn't find the on-off switch for the guns. I've got my trigger all wired up. That's it. The flaps didn't work. That's all I take separate buttons for the flaps. And um, there should be a non off switch somewhere for the guns. So you can turn the guns on and you can make them safe, master arm. And I uh, <laughs> haven't found it yet. So uh, I'll come back to that one. But it's a really nice plane. It flies really well. I love it. It's a really cool aeroplane, the P 51. In fact, Tom Cruise has got one. I mean, the guy's a multi millionaire, Hollywood film actor director whatever so i mean he's got millions tucked away unfortunately i don't have millions so the only p51 i can afford to fly is this one <laughs> i did actually pay about 25 dollars for it downloaded it and uh had a good binge flying it when i first got it in vr obviously and um i haven't flown it since so it's, it's, it's good to go back to it and uh, take it up again. But I've got a free download of the P-47 Thunderbolt, which I will be flying tomorrow. I've got a whole host. I've got P-38 Lightning, um, Vought Corsair, FU Corsair. I'll be hitting them all this week and um, taking them out and thrashing them around. If I can get the guns to work, I'll be shooting down some Germans because we've got active German planes flying over. We've got combat enabled, and it's on the hardest level. So uh, yeah, we should we should have some fun this week here at Manston in Kent. If you want to know where Manston is in Kent, look at a map of England. Go right down to the bottom and go right off to the right until you get to the very end, and that's it. It's right there, quite near to the continent. So they, it got blathered in the Second World War. This is why I'm here. I think it's really cool. Actually, it's got a really, really long runway. I landed Concord here last week. So if you go off the end of the runway at Manston, it's time to hang up your wings. That's what I say. Anyway, I've had a lot of comments. I mentioned the, um, there was a Spitfire that crashed last week and um, some poor chap uh, came a cropper. Uh, his luck ran out. Very sad. Of course it is very sad. But I've had a lot of people criticise me, saying that you shouldn't speculate as to what went wrong. Well, <sighs> yeah, I know, because you know people are going to talk. I mean, look at the the Shoreham Air Show crash. Everybody saw it, and everybody had a camcorder, and everybody filmed it. Well, not not everybody, but loads of people filmed it. We could all see what happened, but we all had to wait for the outcome of the investigation to see what happened. We all know what happened. He went in too low. And when he finished his loop, he didn't have enough altitude left. He ran out of altitude and they went, and loads of people died. So it was a mistake. The, the guy was clearly not guilty of killing people. He, it, it, was, it was an accident for sure. And everybody could see what happened at the time. And everybody said what happened at the time. But we had to wait for the results of the inquest. And I've looked through loads of AARB reports. That's the civilian Air Accidents Investigation Branch, they work for the Civilian Aviation Authority in the UK. Now, the FAA in America will have their own investigation branch. I'm not sure what its correct title is, but and they do. That's their job. They go and look and investigate crashes and look at wreckage and piece together what they think may or may not have happened. And at the end of the day, they come out with an official report. Now, I cannot see in this event of the, the Spitfire that crashed last week, they didn't name the guy. Um, but this was an aircraft from the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, okay? 
it was owned by the RAF. I think the RAF own about six Spitfires. They've grounded them all, quite rightly so as well. Um, and they've got they've got they've got a, a Lancaster bomber, and uh, I mean these airplanes are eighty years old. You know, you cannot get spares for them anymore. You know what spares you can get are 80 years old. Some of them are quite good in, in the box and quite good nick, and others not so good. And a lot of the time you've got to you've got to hand build the parts for these things, you know. And uh, I don't think there's any problem with the engine. I think Ricardo's build Merlin 61s and things like that. I'm not sure. But I seem to remember when I was at Shoreham, there was a big place at the back called Ricardo's, and they did all aviation, you know, old engines like Merlins and things like that. They revamped them all. And well, how many times can you revamp an engine? I don't know. How long is it going to be before aircraft are deemed to be unsafe to fly? Don't get me wrong. I like to see Spitfires. I mean, I'm an aviation enthusiast. I like to see them flying in the air. I think it's great. I remember my dad taking me to the air shows in the 60s to see the Spitfires and the Hurricanes and things. And he said, well, you probably won't see these flying much longer. This may be the last time you'll see them fly. But he was wrong. And here we are 80 years after the war. And uh, they're still flying. People are still rebuilding them. You know, they can rebuild these things Um because people spend millions, millions rebuilding these Spitfires. I was watching this program about this guy in Biggin Hill who rebuilds Spitfires, and uh, a lot of the parts they have to refabricate themselves. So you're pretty much getting a, a, a new Spitfire ish, new ish, I'll say. But you get these purists, you see, you've always got these purists who, who ruin it for everybody really, because uh, they want it all original. And that's going to kill everyone in the end of the day. That's going to kill people because you don't want... Think of it like this. Think of it as a 1930s sports car, okay? And you've got your missus in the car. It's a two-seater and you're thundering down a country lane going, what, what, what? With your scarf in the wind and your goggles on. Well, you've got 1930s brakes, and you've got 1930s steering, and you've got 1930s suspension and tyres and shit like that. You know, you don't want an original. Well, I don't. I mean, I'm one of these people who, who likes to enjoy stuff, but I want it modern. It's like if someone made a new version of the Titanic, Titanic 2, as it's been called. I mean, someone was talking about building one for years, but you're not going to have an exact, authentic copy of the Titanic, are you, without any radar and with no lifeboats and things like that? You know, no. I mean, there are shipping rules you've got to comply to in modern maritime rules. So it has to be safe. And the same applies to old aeroplanes like the Spitfire. You know, one of the things I hate about the Spitfire is the undercarriage is rubbish, okay? It's dreadful. You'll see lots of old films from the war. Um especially when it was windy, you know, you, you 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 had people sitting on the tail trying to keep the thing the right way up. And uh, it was not a good design. It was not a good design. These things were designed with a tail skid to take off on grass into wind. And fine, that's fine if you can do that. But you got to the point where there were so many aeroplanes wanting to take off into wind that they just churn the grass up and it all turns to mud and you just can't operate like that. So... That's when they started building runways, and then they had to build runways in a triangle. So you've got three runways, and you can take off from each end of each runway. So you've effectively got six runways, and hopefully one of them's going to be into wind, depending which way the wind's blowing on any given day. And the Spitfires kept crashing. They kept crashing because they were rubbish. The undercarriage on them was a bad design. It was too narrow. Okay, loads of them have crashed because of the badly designed undercarriage. And the Messerschmitt 109 was even worse. And they soon realised, they thought, shit, this is rubbish. We're going to build better fighters. And the British looked at the Hawker Hurricane and they said, well, that's not had any, there's nothing near as many crashes as the Spitfire. Why? What's the difference? And the Hurricane was about 60 miles an hour slower than the Spitfire. 
Spitfire can do about 350. Okay, and they looked at the nice big wide undercarriage on it, and they thought, there's a Spitfire, they're really narrow undercarriage, and it keeps tipping over and digging a wing tip in and flipping over, smashing all the propeller. Sometimes it finished up on its back. And you think, ah, okay. And then the British sort of said to the Americans, we need you to build Spitfire. We like the Spitfire. Spitfire's great. We're bullying it up. It did all the thing in the Battle of Britain. I'm not dissing the Spitfire. Well, I am sort of. But it was, aeroplanes were evolving. You know, we didn't know, did they? They were finding out what worked and what didn't work. And the British said to the Americans, let's build a new Spitfire, a better one. It, it's got to go further, more range. It's got to escort the bombers all the way to the target. And it's got to come all the way back. And it needs wide undercarriage for a start. And that's what they built this thing for. This was the P-51 Mustang, okay? That was to replace the Spitfire, which they knew was rubbish. Okay, as soon as the war was over, they got rid of the Spitfire. Yes, that goodbye. Yes, and they put them outside RAF bases all over the country as gate guards. They thought, we don't want any more of them. And I sat in a Mark 16 in the Hendon Museum, and that apparently rolled off the production line, hardly was ever flown by anybody, and then they scrapped it. <laughs> That's how good the Spitfire was. Then Supermarine went on to design jets, and they put tail wheels on jets. But again, this was before they, they, they'd even got around to um, configuring the aeroplanes. You know, the aeroplanes today have got tow brakes. You know, there's none of this, like, half brake and differential braking, like in a chipmunk and a, a Spitfire's got, like, a, a brake lever in the middle of the... Thing. What, what's that? It's like a Citroen, isn't it? You know, where you accelerate the pedals on the left-hand side and you think... Oh, oh. No... There comes a point where all aeroplanes sort of become standardised. You work out a theory and you think, right, this works. Let's all do it this way. And every, all the car manufacturers did it. They said, right, okay, we'll put the accelerator on the right, the brake in the middle, and we'll put the clutch on the left. Is that okay with everybody else? All the other manufacturers, and they all went, yeah, yeah, that seems to work. Yeah, so they all did the same. So coming back to aeroplanes, Spitfire wasn't quite there, was it? This differential braking and um, that silly tailwheel it had, it was all over the place. It had to be manhandled, people on the end of each wing and things like this, to try and get it into the right place for takeoff. And that's no good. You want to start the thing up and taxi it out and go. Now, the P51 had uh, what's known as a tailwheel lock. Because you've got a big, powerful engine. You've got really narrow undercarriage. You, as you open the tap and start increasing throttle, it's going to go... Whoosh, it's called ground looping, right? They just spin round. Do you get a shopping trolley from the... Not a shopping trolley, a trolley from the airport. The back wheels the back wheels swivel like a shopping trolley, but the front ones are fixed. Now, if you push it and let go of it, it's going to spin round and it's going to go backwards across the concourse. That's exactly what you're trying to do with a tailwheel, you know. And that thing wants to turn around and go backwards down the runway unless you stop it from doing that. So it's a bad design, the tailwheel, okay. And they soon evolved and they put nose wheels on all the planes and they thought, oh, wow, yes. And all of a sudden, nobody making tailwheels anymore. But getting back to the last of the tailwheels, we're talking the P-51, the P-47, the... Vought course there, uh, and then everything started going nose wheel after that. Everything. And that was the end of the road for the big piston engine tail wheel fighters. This had a tail wheel lock. If you pull the stick back, right, it'll lock the tail wheel. It's going nowhere. It's, it's got only a few degrees either side. You can apply the power, but you keep the stick back. The tail wheel locks on. The elevators are up, so it's pinning the tail to the ground, and you can set off. As it picks up speed, you can gradually, gradually, as you've got wind over the rudder, you can move the stick forward until you start. the tail starts to pick up. But the fault with the Spitfire, of course, was once you did that and you got the tail up, it's only got to come up a bit too far, and the propellers will break off on the ground. 
So you've got to be double, double careful. I mean, the Spitfire and the Messerschmitt 109 were the worst tail wheels in the world. You know, you fly a Piper Cub, but it's totally different. Oh, I mean, I've got 150 hours on a PZL 104, which is a Wilga. And that was quite a handful at times, but it was a slow stall aircraft. At the end of the day, if you started to go wrong, you can pull back on the stick. And the thing will lift off because it's a slow speed. But not these. This is this is going to do 100 miles an hour before this takes off. Same with the Spitfire. Anyway, getting back to the Spitfire. Crash. We're talking an 80-year-old aeroplane here. Let's just say it was built in the, in the war. I don't know what mark of Spitfire they made. They upgraded the Spitfire as the war went on. And at the end of the war, they just got rid of them, didn't they? So let's just say, off the top of my head, without the actual data, let's just say it was built in the war, which was early 40s. So there you got 80 years later. You got the purists uh, with, the, with the clothes peg on the nose. <laughs> no modifications, leave it original. Ah. So the poor guy's got to get in it and fly it like it was in the 30s and the 40s, you know, with all the original instruments and all that crap that's in there, which I would personally rip out and replace. I'd have modern tow brakes, hydraulic tow brakes on it. You can't really make it the undercarriage wider because it would be wrong, wouldn't it? But you, you could put modern tow brakes in there. You can put modern radios in there. You can put modern instruments in there. You can do a lot to make it safer and uh i guess they didn't do that i left it original i mean they will have taken the guns out of course and they might have some dummy guns sticking out and um but my guess is that this particular aircraft was an original spitfire it's owned by the uh battle of britain memorial flight which is a squadron i think the coningsby and they operate all these old dodgy old airplanes that should be in a museum you know, if they're not going to upgrade them and make them seriously modern as possible. And uh, they should just be in a museum, just park them up. It's great to see them. I, I personally like to see them, but, they, you know, you, you've got to take safety into account, haven't you? You've got to draw a line at some point and say, that's too old, you can't fly that. Um but then people will build modern ones, new ones, won't they? And they'll, they'll probably have tow brakes and all the modern cons in there, modern instruments that don't topple when you go upside down. I mean, how ludicrous is that? You've got to cage the actual artificial horizon so you can do a loop to stop the gyro from toppling. And it goes like, uh, uh, what's that telling you? I mean, the only time you're going to lose sight of the ground is if you're dogfighting in the war is when you're in cloud and people will dive into cloud to to hide to, to hide from the enemy and then pop out somewhere else and come back and get tucked in again but if your artificial horizon is not telling you which way up you are and you're in cloud you're going to possibly scream out the bottom of the cloud in a dive and just go straight into the ground so it's very important that the artificial horizon the attitude indicator tells you which way up you are when you can't see which way up you are, because that's the whole purpose of it. So what's the use of putting in a piece of crap that doesn't work? Having flown a few German aircraft this week, I can honestly say the German instruments did work really, really well. doesn't matter which way up the plane was, the instrument worked. And this is, this is the point I'm trying to make. You should modernise them, make them as safe as possible. You can't have an old 80-year-old plane expect someone to get in it and fly it and then it conks out because it's defective i don't see how the raf can get out of being held responsible for it because they owned it it was owned by the ministry of defense the best battle of britain memorial flight it was maintained by raf mechanics it was signed off by raf mechanics and it was flown by an raf pilot and it finished up nose diving into a field so you, you've got to ask yourself what happened and they say oh, don't speculate don't speculate well the reason they're saying don't speculate is because they're going to get sued you know if it's proven the airplane was defective then uh, the pilot's family are in for a big payout loads of wonga for sure they've told him to get into a defective airplane 
he sucked it up and it's killed him. I mean, there's got to be a reason it crashed. So you've got to ask yourself, what what are the possible reasons that thing could crash? You know, and the most likely, and there's a lot of pilots out there listening to me now. I mean, the answer is I don't know. I don't know. But I'm just thinking of what is the most likely thing that went wrong? And the most likely thing that went wrong is the engine's maybe not stopped, but there was a distinct power loss. Um, and the pilot thought, shit, let's get this back and put it back on the ground. And uh, that's my guess from, what, from what, what's been said. So if the aircraft was defective, um, yeah, family's in for a big payout from the Ministry of Defence for sure. If the aircraft wasn't defective, maybe the pilot was uh, was on the phone. You know, he was he was texting a friend. Oh, I'm just oh. and he was like this texting. He wasn't looking where he was going. I don't think so. I really don't think so. I think that's highly unlikely. And uh, a Jerry fighter might have jumped him and shot him down. You know, and there'd be all bullet holes in the wreckage, wouldn't they? I don't think that is the case either. So, the most likely reason that aeroplane crashed was it was defective which means the pilot's family are going to sue the arse off the Ministry of Defence and get a shitload of money out of them. That's why they don't want you to talk about it. That's my opinion. And we won't know because they're investigating themselves, aren't they? We're Ministry of Defence, we're investigating ourselves to find out if we've slipped up. And if we've slipped up, maybe we'll pay someone off, maybe we won't. And they're going to string it out for as long as possible. And they'll probably come to a mm, conclusion where they're not sure really what happened. It might have been this, it might have been that, might have been the other. Whereas the civilians, you see, because it's a military airplane, it's owned by the military. It's the Ministry of Defence that do the accident investigation. Whereas if it had been a civilian plane, if I owned this, for example, this was a civilian airplane and I crashed it, Oh, the CIA would be straight on it. The air accident investigation would be straight on it. They'd be rummaging it, ripping it apart, checking everything. Whereas I'd have no say in it. But because it's the Ministry of Defence, they go... Whenever they say, seal all the, all the logs, That's they, they, they seize them, they grab them, put them all in bags and seal them before any mechanic can get to it and alter something that might have or might not have you know and they just seal everything seal it and you hear them say seal the logs seal all the tech logs seize all the tech logs that's why they ground everything because there might be a problem i mean the ministry of defense are honest people they're not they're not they're not um criminally minded or um particularly dishonest i mean they're going to go through the procedure of investigation um, in, in, a, in a positive way and in the meantime they're going to ground everything because there might be a fault there might have been a, an update that they've done which has caused the problem and if that's the case if someone else takes another plane up the same thing might happen to them so they ground everything until they get to the bottom of what they reckon the problem was and it's obviously some sort of power loss I think is the most likely cause. Power loss can be caused by a number of things, and we won't know until the, 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 the investigation. I mean, the, the, the worst case of power loss is uh, it ran out of fuel, which is unlikely. It's highly, highly unlikely that a Spitfire going off on a um, an air show would run out of fuel. Unless somebody messed up. And if it's a twin engine aeroplane and both engines stop at the same time, it's definitely fuel. So, but like I say, you know, everyone is going to talk about it. Everyone is going to speculate. And they say don't speculate, but you can't help it. People do chat and they think, well, it could have been this, it could have been that. And the point is nobody knows what it was. But I cannot see how the Royal Air Force can get out of it at all because they're totally responsible for everything they're responsible for the aircraft they own it they're responsible for the maintenance of that aircraft they signed it off 
the pilot was working for the Air Force. Okay, he flew it and he crashed it. Now, if it was deemed to be pilot error, if, if they decided there was nothing wrong with the plane and he just crashed it because he was uh, not focused or whatever, then they'll get out of paying him any money. I mean, there'll, there'll be some sort of pension, of course, but if it's proved that the aircraft was defective and that led to his death, they'd be in for the family being for a massive payout. Massive. Anyway, that's my thoughts on the matter, for what little I know on the subject. But I've been in aviation for many years and I've seen many crashes. One of my own aeroplanes crashed in quite a bad way. It was, uh, you can look it up, Golf Bravo Oscar Sierra Papa, which was a PA-28-151 Warrior, which I leased from... Falcon Flying Service is a big in hill, and uh, it was. Uh, I was operating it at Durham. It was a great little plane, really, really good little plane. And uh, one of the other flying schools um, subleased it off me, and uh, a couple of their pilots took it flying. Very experienced guys. Anyway, they stuffed it, they stuffed it, they crashed it in uh, Clacton on Sea, and of course, AAIB was all over it trying to find out when uh, end of the day they did they didn't actually conclude anything they said that both the pilots don't remember what happened they remember coming into land and then it bounced and went into the trees and uh, they were they were cut from the wreckage and they went to hospital and the uh, aib said well they couldn't find anything wrong with the airplane the engine was producing full power at the time it hit the trees because they can tell these things by the damage to the propeller blades and things like this and uh nobody saw it nobody people at the airport were not watching what happened and so the the, the end of the day the the air accidents investigation concluded that they didn't know what caused the crash Well, I know what caused the crash. I reckon they messed up. The pilot messed up. <laughs> That's sort of obvious, isn't it? Um, but they didn't. They didn't conclude that. That wasn't the findings of the uh, of the investigation. They just said they didn't know what caused it. Pilots couldn't remember. And you, look, I've looked at lots of crash investigations over the years and, and they all they all come out with the bleeding obvious really at the end of the day unless they actually find something uh critical that's in there that's caused it i remember my dad telling me about the canberra bomber that crashed uh, in the 50s and that all the crew were killed and the air accidents investigation had been through it with a fine tooth comb and they found a spanner a spanner had been left in the engine somewhere and it had even been smashed to pieces, this spanner. It had devastated the engine. And uh, they'd pieced the spanner back together for all the fragments. And they said this was left in the engine. <clears throat> other, other instances, I think there was the runaways with the, with the elevator trim. You have electric elevator trim. You've got an actuator. And it winds the thing forwards and backwards. And if it runs away, it can run away. Put the aircraft in a dive, which is unrecoverable, and uh, that's the sort of thing that the air accidents investigation branch are really good at. Because what, if they can establish what caused the crash, they can then put recommendations in and fixes for all the other aircraft in the fleet. Right, ground them all until you fix this problem to stop the things running away. You can have a cut or whatever the whatever the fix was. So they're there for a very good reason. You know, they're not there to be awkward they're there for safety reasons and i have to ask myself is it safe to keep flying these 80 year old airplanes um, without any decent modifications modern modernized modifications done to them i don't know what do you think answers down below i'll be glad to hear it thanks for watching <laughs>